Um, I will get started a little early, I guess, and introduce myself. So I am not Brad Hedlund, who was the, uh, you know, not quite as good looking as him, so I figured you guys would have called me out if I said otherwise. But uh, I am Dan Wenland. I'm Brad, for uh, family reasons, wasn't able to make it at the last minute. So um, I was one of the original NYSERA team members, um, was an engineer at NYSERA, helped build up the technology, worked with a lot of our customers. Now NYSERA is part of VMware, uh, so I'm at VMware. And um, I've also, you guys may know me that I've, for the past two years, I was the PTL of the Quantum Project, or the form project formerly known as the Quantum Project. And so um, I'm recently just stepping down on that to focus more on VMware activities. So with that, I'll probably wait. You haven't started the video yet, have you? Got a couple more minutes. Um, I was going to say there's plenty of room on the floor, but that's actually not true. Um, <laughs> if you want to be sitting on the floor, you're going to kind of have to be up here. like it's been 10.59 for about three minutes. <laughs> Still 10.59. All right, so it's officially 11. I want to get started quickly because we have a lot of stuff to cover. So, um, oh, people are tweeting. That's good. Um, <laughs> so I'm Dan Wenland, filling in for Brad, giving this talk. He wasn't able to make it. Uh, like I said, I was uh, part of the original NYSERA engineering team, helped out with a lot of our deployments. We're now at VMware. Uh, for the past two years, I've been the lead of the Quantum Project. I'm just stepping down um, to focus more on VMware OpenStack activities. So to give you an idea of what this talk is, is intended to be, is it's what I would usually do with a customer in our first meeting on a whiteboard. I hate PowerPoint, but given the logistics here, I guess I've been forced to do that. So I stole a bunch of slides from Brad. So if it's all text and looks like crap, it's from me. If it's shiny and pretty, it's probably from Brad. You can, you can guess on this one. OK, so I want to start out by talking about network virtualization, because you have to understand the problem we're trying to solve before you understand why we build the system. Most of this talk will be about nitty gritty technical details. So most of you are familiar with compute virtualization. right? You take physical hardware server resources, things like storage, CPU, RAM, NIC, and you use really smart virtualization software to slice it up, decouple from the physical infrastructure, and be able to let people automate the provision of those resources. So you can think about network virtualization in much the same way. You've got physical network resources. You have a virtual switch. Maybe you even have something like a hardware load balancer. Uh, you want to be able to have a soft, really smart software abstraction layer that can automatically, you know, can, be, can automate the deployment of the network configuration your workload needs, not just the, the compute configuration, right? Because you're only kind of as good as your weakest link. And if you have only virtualized your compute, right, but you still have to wait days for your network to be deployed, you haven't really solved your problem. So that's the marketing definition of network virtualization. This is what I think the technical definition is. And that you'll see how this kind of manifests itself in the design. So network virtualization is, a faithful reproduction of the properties you have in the physical network. 
So do you have, you know, could the workload tell the difference between it being on a real physical network and on a virtualized network? I would argue that if you have real network virtualization, the answer there would be no. Just like a, you know, OS workload can't tell the difference between it being on a, you know, physical CPU and a vCPU. You have to be fully isolated, just like a virtual machine has, has memory that it can't possibly address the, the, you know, the, the, the memory of another VM. You need full isolation so that you know, no network might address another tenant's network, or even two tenants could use overlapping addresses. Could you basically take one network environment and just clone and deploy another? You need to be able to have place workloads in a way that isn't physically dependent on the location within the network. For example, can two VMs be on the same you know, virtual layer two segment, even if they're not on the same physical layer two segment. Can you migrate a VM from one layer two segment in the physical world to another without its connectivity being changed? Likewise, is there any, you need to be independent of the physical state of the network. So, you know, do you, if you have to touch, you know, your physical hardware in order to deploy a workload or to apply a firewall policy, your network probably isn't virtualized, right? The, it, when you've truly virtualized the network, all that state is pulled up into the virtualization abstraction layer, and none of it's in your physical hardware. And one other thing, just to call out what I'm not talking about when I'm talking about network virtualization, is I'm not talking about simply running networking you know, software in a virtual machine. There are valid and reasonable use cases for that, but that doesn't really change the operational model. Um, it's really just that you're consuming x86 cycle, cycles rather than dedicated A6 cycles. Okay, so now what I'm actually here to talk about, which is the Nicira Network Virtualization Platform. So it's a, it's a software networking platform, and we'll go into all the technical details. It's compatible with KVM, Zen Server, and VMware. Uh, we released 1.0 back in uh, July of 2011. Uh, we were, you know, many people know we're part of the Rackspace deployment, which is the largest open stack deployment that at least I know of. Um, one of the really cool things about MVP is that we release four times a year. In fact, it used to be eight, but now that we're VMware, they made us slow down to four. Um, <laughs> you know, and it, to me, it's a great example of how, you know, you've heard the phrase, software is eating the world. Right? Think about the amount of innovation, the set of, so, the, the, the set of features you get in the time that would take you to go through a hardware refresh cycle. So our current release, which we'll be talking about today, is MVP 3.0, so that was our Q1 release. And we're just about to put out uh, 3.1, which will be available end of April. So this is the kind of, this will be our visual outline for, for today. This is the entire MVP stack that we'll be talking about. So this is kind of, uh, you know, from, from the most basic and most physical to the highest management layer. So kind of physical network to management layers. Um, and we'll be kind of taking a path from the bottom of the stack up to the top and then circling around to get some of the other environments. And before I talk about a given component, I'll highlight where we are in the stack. So hopefully you can, you can keep uh, context. So here's a, here's a very high level view of what a, a MVP deployment will look like. The first thing to recognize is that from a physical perspective, we treat the physical network just as a layer three fabric. All we care about is IP connectivity between different points at the edge. So if you guys are familiar with Open vSwitch, which we'll talk about a bit more, that's in all of our edge components, so in our hypervisors, in these things that we call gateways, which are how you get in and out of this virtual network space. Those are all data forwarding elements, anything that has OVS in this picture. We'll deep dive into each of those. And then there's the MVP controller, which is software um, control plane only never handles any packets that manages all those OVSs um, and can be driven both by something like OpenStack Quantum and from an operational perspective, we have an operational tool that I'll show you as well called MVP Manager. And basically the goal right, is that tenants will describe logical networks that they want via the Quantum APIs and MVP will manage in a very detailed way the flow state of all these OVSs and will create tunnels across the physical L3 fabric so that the you know, the workloads themselves believe that the, that the network that they're connected to looks like their logical model, not this much more complicated physical model. So in everything we do, right, there's a non-virtualized view, which is what we call this, and then there's the virtual view. The virtual is kind of the platonic, simple view that someone would create via an API. Just describes what they care about, none of the other complicated stuff. So you can create as many of these virtual network containers as you want. This is, you know, an example of a three-tier web application that uplinks to the outside world via NAT. You could clone, copy, you can have multiple tenants who create multiple of these. They can over, 
I can use the same addresses. They never conflict because just like a virtual machine, they're an entirely isolated container. You know, you can make modifications to these guys. Let's say maybe you have one that doesn't want to uplink to the internet. It wants to uplink to its remote uh, you know, customer premise. Right? So remember, this is the difference when we say the virtualized view, which we're talking with the logical API abstractions you define, and the non-virtualized view, which is the, kind of the real world where we're actually forwarding packets. So again, like I said, we're going to start out working from the bottom. So what MVP aims to let you do is treat your physical network like you treat your compute servers. What does that mean? It means a couple things. So first off, you can treat it as a big pool of capacity to be sliced up on demand flexibly for tenants, right? What do you do when you buy your compute capacity, right? You look at some price performance ratio, you say, oh, this seems like a good deal. I'm going to buy a bunch of racks there. You pull them in, and then you just kind of programmatically, you do one-time setup, and then the rest is just programmatic spinning of workloads of, of, you know, onto that to consume that capacity. Then you consume the capacity, and you move on. So secondly, we rely on only on commodity features, specifically L3 forwarding capability within the physical network. And why that's important is it means you can get your network hardware from anyone. Right? You can buy it from one person, and then when you're building out your next data center, you can decide to buy it from another. Right? You're no longer really tied to a particular network vendor because just like you aren't necessarily tied to a particular server vendor because you have x86 as your simple commodity interface to buying that server hardware. Thirdly, the configuration of the physical network should only be done once, just like your physical servers. Right? You rack them, you give them IP addresses, and you're done. You never touch it again. There should never, ever be a human in the loop right, when you're provisioning application workloads. Right? If you have a human in the loop and you're you know, racing against Amazon, right, you've lost. Right? You've already blown your price point out of the water. Finally, you should have the flexibility to change and update your physical network architecture you know, from one data center to another as you know, trends and, and, and such change without that impacting the abstractions you expose to workloads. Right? Your API shouldn't have to change just because you decided to you know, take L3 from, the top, you know, from your ag layer to your top of rack. So this is, a, <laughs> this is a Brad picture, you can tell. Um, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with, with the idea of a fat tree network or a class network, but one of the really neat things about MVP is that it lets you have any physical network topology you want because all it cares about is L3 connectivity between the hypervisors. So that means what you can do is you can actually run your layer three down at your top of rack or your leaf switch, as they're labeled in these pictures. And that lets you take advantage of really good multipathing. Because we all know there are issues with L2 and spanning tree. So the best thing to do is to make your L2 domains, for bandwidth at least, to make them as small as possible. And so this is the type of design uh, you, know, you can go to. But the neat thing about MVP right, is it doesn't require a design like this. Maybe you start out in your data center with, um, with you know, your standard you know, uh, L3 at your egg layer, and then your next rev of your data center goes like this. Your tenants don't need to care, right? Because it's just IP connectivity to the network virtualization platform. Okay, so moving up a stack, uh, we'll start to dive into what the hypervisor layer, in particular Open vSwitch, looks like. So most of you are probably familiar with Open vSwitch at this point. It's an open source uh, virtual switch. It was started with a code contribution from NICERA back when we were kind of building the first OpenFlow implementation back in the day. Um, it's been uploaded into the Linux kernel, um, and it's a major building block for actually a majority of the quantum plugins today. So this kind of confuses people, and people tend to have a bit of a misconception about Open vSwitch. We'll show some of the, the kind of the code and process details, and, or not the code details, but the, the binary details in the next page. But one thing that is a common point of confusion is people think of Open vSwitch like a hardware switch, which has a single feature set, and anyone who uses it gets the same feature set. Really the way to think about Open vSwitch is that it's a, it's a software engine for doing generic flow lookups and tunneling of, of network traffic. And so what really matters is how are you kind of programming that engine in those flow lookup tables. Uh, you know, you can do everything from really simple, which is just basically tell Open vSwitch to just do dumb L2 learning, right? And then it'll work just like a Linux bridge, right? Um, <laughs> or, you know, you can make it very complex and do L2, L3 forwarding, ACLing, quality of service, all of this, all this stuff. So think of Open vSwitch more as like a Swiss Army knife that you can use to build really cool things. And that's why, even though there are a bunch of different plugins based on Open vSwitch, they all have different capabilities and advantages and disadvantages. So here's, here's some of the more technical details. So Open vSwitch 
is both user space and kernel components. So what you're looking at is that, that blue box is a single Linux host. It has two NICs, ETH1 and ETH, or ETH0 and ETH1. ETH0 is connected to a management network. That's where your MVP controller would be. And there are two uh, processes in user space, OVSDB server and OVSV switch D, that phone home to the controller. One is using the OpenFlow protocol. That's for kind of low level uh, flow programming. And the other is using something called the OVS database protocol. That's for higher level kind of configuration state, things like tunnels, et cetera. And then OpenV switch has a really small embedded database where it stores persistent data in case your hypervisor reboots and stuff like that. And then the, the two blocks on the on the right are actual open vSwitch bridges. So this is what you know, actually does traffic forwarding. So brint is, is a com name commonly used for what we call the integration bridge. This is where all of your VMs in a, in a hypervisor plug in. Unlike kind of the old model of network vir or, uh, of virtual networking, where you'd plug you know, different NICs into bridges specific to particular uh, ethernet devices, with MVP, right, you could logically rewire the connectivity that VM's going to have on demand. So we don't know that we should wire web VM into ETH, the ETH1 bridge yet, right? Because we don't know what connectivity you might want to change it to have later. So everything plugs into brint. And then MVP, based on the logical configuration, will dispatch the packets and filter them and prioritize them appropriately. In particular, a common thing, right, is that the traffic has to be sent to another hypervisor. And with MVP, it's often done using L2 and L3 tunneling. And we'll cover that um, in, a, in a slide or two. But basically what that means is the packets will be filtered and processed and then handed off to the Linux IP stack, which will then just use its normal the IP address of the hypervisor to send a packet out on the physical network via one of its NICs. So good, I was hoping this was the next slide. Like I said, this wasn't my slide deck. So, um, so a really important thing to understand is this L2 and L3 tunneling and why it's important. So, Think for a second about if you want to have this true, fully isolated environment uh, where two, two different tenants or two copies of something for the same tenant, for that matter, a prod and a, and a, and a test dev environment, right, could be using the exact same set of IPs, even the exact same set of Macs. What you need is an encapsulation layer so that, that the addresses chosen by one tenant would never conflict with the addresses chosen by another. This is similar to what a, hyper, what a compute hypervisor would do with something like virtual memory. Uh, so if you think about it, what happens is that the packet that the, that the VM actually sends, which is represented by blue, is sent out, and the IPs and Macs in there are IP addresses and MAC addresses of virtual machines that may be on that same uh, you know, virtual network. What happens then is it's handed off to OVS, there's processing, and then the hypervisor is going to slap on another header. And that, that header has the IP addresses of the hypervisors and the MAC addresses of hypervisors and then it's sent across the physical network. And this is what fundamentally decouples, it gives us all that you know, location, state, um, independence that we talked about in our definition of network virtualization. So that's why you know, this kind of tunneling is pretty fundamental to the concept of network virtualization. It also has some pretty cool side effects, which is that, like I said before, your physical network stays really simple because all it does is connect hypervisors, right? So you configure it once with the IP addresses of the hypervisors, and then you just never touch it again. All of the additional state is in the logical layer. You never have to, when a tenant spins up, you know, provision additional things in the physical network. So this is a bit of an aside, and I probably don't have time to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway, um, just because this is a huge point of, of confusion. So people tend to conflate the tunneling protocol and network virtualization. Tunneling is important to network virtualization, but it's just part of the solution. What really matters is the logic for how the flows are set up and your control plane for pushing those rules in. Here's two examples. So first off, you know, GRE, you know, I often hear people say like, oh, I use, um, I'm using, you know, uh, Quantum with GRE for, you know, network virtualization. And the answer is, well, GRE is just a tunneling format, right? GRE was around for years before anyone figured out, you know, how to put it in combination with a programmable switch to be able to provision these kind of tunnels and virtualize networks on demand. Similarly, if you guys have heard of VXLAN, right? VXLAN was originally proposed and the primary mechanism for populating flows relied on multicast, which meant it was a total pain in the butt to use, right? So do me a favor when you're thinking about network virtualization, it's not just about the protocol, right? In fact, things like MVP can work with whatever protocol you want and even multiple protocols simultaneously. 
right? We can pick the right protocol based on the properties you want from your virtual network. For example, if you have a virtual network that spans a WAN segment that's untrusted, we can make sure that the tunneling protocol includes IPsec for security, right? Or let's say that you need to communicate from a virtual network to a physical workload that's on a switch that supports VXLAN. Well, then we should probably encapsulate that packet with VXLAN because the ASIC in the switch wouldn't understand any other type of tunneling protocol. So really think of the tunneling protocol more as a, just a tool or a portion of the solution of network virtualization. The tunneling protocol itself doesn't really solve any problem. Okay, now on to the cool stuff, the control plane. So MVP controller, just some basics. So it's x86 software, runs on Linux. It's, you know, it's built with a lot of uh, distributed systems knowledge for high availability, for scale out. We'll talk more about that in a minute. It exposes a northbound API to a management system like Quantum. It uses a southbound API like we just saw to talk to open vSwitch. And essentially what the controller does is it's always mapping between logical and physical. So right, there's something, there's some logical configuration that was given to it by the API. And there's some physical world out there, right, with VMs actually located on hypervisors in certain locations. And basically the role of the controller is to always push down the flow state so that those two are always in sync. And if a VM migrates, right, we're going to have to update the flow state to make sure that that's in sync. And if someone makes an API call to change the configuration, like change the security policy, we're going to have to push down new flows to make sure all of that's in sync. It sounds really easy, you know, when described at that level. But when you start to look at all the sets of features and all the things you're managing, it actually gets extremely complex. So one other very, very important thing to, to know about is MVP controllers are never, ever, ever, ever in the data plane, right? You know, we see at, at large service providers, we see individual hosts that send, you know, up, upwards of, you know, tens of thousands of packets a second, right? If you want to manage a real data center where you can have workloads like that, you know, good luck getting that up to all go to a centralized controller. Right, the reality is sometimes people will make arguments that, well, for average case, you know, it's doable. And that may be true, right? But, you know, you don't want your network just to work in the average case. So this is, you can guess you made this slide. Um, this is talking a bit more about the controller, and particularly its HA policies and its scale-out policies. So HA and scale-out obviously are very fundamental to what you need in the network control plane. So with MVP, you can have... Basically, you can cluster, right, a set of hosts. They all communicate, and what they do is they take all the work that they need to do, and they slice it up into little chunks, and they schedule it to controllers. And I don't think they really show it here, but for a given piece of work, you know, there's the primary controller, and there's a backup controller, so if one of those controllers dies, the other one's right ready there to take, take advantage of it. Um, you know, we use good distributed system algorithms, so there's no chance of split brain. And there's even really, really cool stuff you can do, like live software upgrades of your control plane without ever taking the entire system down, right? Because you can take down an individual node, upgrade it, bring it back up, take down, right, without, without ever actually losing. It kind of looks like a, like a failover to the system. So, I mean, it's just incredible to see, you know, upgrading a, you know, uh, the control plane managing, you know, tens of thousands of VMs without ever taking it down. Like, if you've ever been part of a real network upgrade before, you'd understand just kind of how mind-blowing that is. Oh, and look, you can add more nodes. We need more capacity and the workloads flow over there. And then I think one of these is guys going to die. Yep, someone takes over those workloads. Okay, moving up a little further in the stack. This is detail that I'm not going to go into, but the slides will be posted. So um, you'll be able to look at it there. Think of the MVP API as having two big chunks. One of it describes the physical world. This is the information that the controller needs to know to be able to decide who's going to tunnel to who and what IP addresses those tunnels use and and all of that, right? How to do its HA policies, et cetera. The second one is the virtualized abstractions. These are essentially what quantum uses to create these logical topologies for tenants. And one of the things you'll notice here, right, is that it's not just about creating L2 segments that are better than VLANs, right? You can create logical L3, you can create security policies, um, port security, ACLs, quality of service, packet statistics, port mirroring, et cetera. Right? It's really about giving that full tool set of, you know, of the, of, you know, that, that, you know, we built up over the years because we understand it's necessary to operate a network. You need to have visibility, right? You need to have counters. You need to be able to prioritize. Um, it's about being able to provide that whole feature set. And the controller, the real magic of the controller is for it to be able to 
take all of these different logical abstractions, look at where all the workloads are anywhere in your data center, and be able to calculate the right set of flows to push down to everyone so that it's all consistent. So moving up one more layer on the stack, there's quantum in the quantum API. I should be able to describe this one pretty well. <laughs> At least I hope. <laughs> I guess the pressure is high now. Um, so if you guys are familiar with OpenStack, which hopefully many of you are, right? There's some set of clients over there, which uh, could be tenant scripts, could be the Horizon GUI, could be some other platform that you've built on top and it's just consuming MVP API or quantum APIs. And there's different services. So there's Quantum, which is the network service, and there's Nova, which is the compute service. And in OpenStack, things are built so that there are generic logical APIs, and there are different technology-dependent backends that implement those APIs. So on the network side, we might be using the MVP plugin. Um, I didn't actually pick a driver. Um, I'll say the KVM driver on Nova. <laughs> so uh, you know, and then, and then I'll walk through the basic flow of what happens here. So first, a tenant might say, create me a network network one, and I might say, boot me a VM on network one. And what would happen is that Nova would actually go to Quantum and create a port on that network. And Quantum would actually pass that through, request through to the MVP plugin. The MVP plugin would actually go talk to that MVP controller cluster and use the API I just described to create a port. It would get an ID back and it would return that ID to Nova. And you'll see why in a second. Because ultimately, Nova is then going to find, it's going to schedule to some Nova compute node, and it's going to pass that port ID along, saying, when you create a VNIC for this VM, it's this port, it's this quantum port ID that it's associated with. And the reason that's really important is that if you think about it, you need to complete this loop, right? NVP, who's managing Open vSwitch, needs to be able to understand that when there's a Linux device created on Open vSwitch, which, which, uh, which quantum port is that associated with and which logical network should it be on and what security settings should it have? And so the fact is when Nova creates a VM and plugs that NIC into OVS, it actually passes that port ID and then Open vSwitch essentially reports that state to the controller. And the controller says, oh, okay, I know this VM. There's already a port in MVP created for it. It's supposed to have this security policy, this quality of service, et cetera. Okay. So now we've moved all the way up the stack, and now I'm just going to hit a couple things on the side. Um, L2, L3 gateways are actually a really complicated topic that probably could have an entire talk of its own. So I'm just going to kind of touch, touch base. So gateways at a high level. So we talked about how we use tunneling between different OVS devices, which is great when everything you want to talk to is connected to an OVS device. What happens when that's not true? Like, you want to talk to the internet. Right? You need a gateway between your virtualized network world and your physical network world. And there's lots of really interesting, if you're a nerd, um, you know, things about how those two things interface. And so we're just going to talk about two of the models today, which is there's a layer two model, which is basically the Ethernet model at you know, which you can interface. And there's a layer three model, basically a routed uh, model where you can interface. So first about the layer two. So layer two gateways, essentially let you take physical workloads or even a, you know, a VLAN and a remote customer premises right, and connect it up at layer two to a logical network in a cloud. So if I'm a service provider right, and I want you know, my tenants to be able to spin up VMs that, uh, you know, VMs that appear to be showing up on their you know, own customer premises at layer two, I can use an L2 gateway. Now, layer two means that there's actually broadcast, for example, sent between these two. These web VMs could be using a DHCP server located in the customer premise, et cetera. Now, obviously, this does nothing to change the speed of light. But you know, assuming that your, your, your proximity is good enough, you could choose to go with the L3, L2 gateway approach and do that. So here we have a pretty simple switch, which is one logical switch with two web VMs. And then it's uplinked to a VLAN that's in a customer premises right, with two database servers on it. So that's the virtualized view, nice and simple, right? Yeah. What's the, what's the non-virtualized view? Remember, this is what the controller sets up automatically. So you don't need to worry about it, but I'm just showing this to kind of uh, help you understand what the controller is doing. So first off, you can see both the gateways and the hypervisors are phoned into the MVP controller. That's how the MVP controller is understanding what's plugged into them, is pushing flows down to them, is monitoring status, et cetera. Right? And you can see that there are tunnels set up uh, between in the hypervisors and something called a service node, which I'll talk about in a, in a little bit. 
and then eventually to the L2 gateway. So what I'm showing you here is actually the most complicated case. Right? There's the simpler case is that the hypervisors can just directly tunnel to the, to the L2 gateway. That's what would happen if it's like a service provider with physical hosting and cloud hosting in the same environment. But in this case, we can actually do multi-hop kind of tunneling to reach a remote customer premises that's on the other side of the WAN. And we can even be smart enough, for example, as this shows, to use unencrypted, more efficient tunneling within the data center. But then for over going over the WAN using secure tunneling, which of course consumes more CPU but is worth it because you don't know who might be sniffing over the WAN. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, Another thing with L3 gateways, so L3 gateways are basically a way to interface. I probably should have included a logical diagram here, but it's pretty close to what we showed in that first picture, where the way you uplink to the internet in, the, in that three-tier topology that we had was via a router. And that actually gives us some additional flexibility in terms of how efficient we can make the gateways. So if kind of it's all the same to you, it's probably a good idea to go with the L3 gateway. A couple really cool things about the L3 gateway are how it works with HA and scale out. So HA, means you know, if one of these gateway nodes dies, we need to make sure that you know, nearly instantaneously that traffic is rerouted to another one uh, so that the, the flow continues. And more importantly, that any of the state, for example, NAT connection tracking state, is actually transferred from the active gateway to the backup gateway. So you can see here, uh, I don't think, I'm not sure these numbers all match up, but you get the idea that you can have an active router that's on one of the gateway nodes and then it's backup, or you can specify the number of backups you want, but it's backup will be on one or, or, or several other gateway nodes. And you can even split them up into failure zones. So you can say, right, let's say that, that you, know, you want your gateways to be resilient to the upstream switch failing. So what you do is you actually have them uplink through different upstream switches, and you have two different clusters of L3 gateways. And so what MVP will do then is make sure, and I'm trying to scan this, it looks like, Looks like this is roughly followed here, but I'm not totally sure. That, um, that your active and your backups will always be in different failure zones. So that the, you know, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the switches being, one of the physical switches that you're uplink to getting knocked out, you'd fail over to an active immediately, or to a backup immediately. Another really important thing is that failover happens based on data plane probing. So it's one thing to say like, oh, you know, I periodically send hellos back to a control plane server, and if I don't get five hellos in a row after 20 seconds, I'm going to fail over to another guy. You know, this is actually done using data plane probing from the individual hypervisors. So if the hypervisors are able to detect that a gateway is down, uh, it's actually able to fail over very, very quickly to an active gateway. This one, I'm not going to go into all the detail here. This is the same slide that I showed you before about the physical fabric. But I wanted to highlight one more thing, which I didn't talk about last time, which is in the, in the bottom right corner there, you can see that there are kind of, you can imagine a, kind of a special set of pods where you tend to put your L2 or L3 gateways. Because remember, within, within most of your data center, the only IPs that you really need to think about routing uh, are the IP addresses of hypervisors and your gateways and your controllers, right? Just the infrastructure IPs. So, but then you need to make sure, for example, that if your L3 gateways are used to uplink to the WAN, right, you need to route your WAN connectivity to a particular cab or set of cabs in your physical data center. So that's what this represents. It also shows um, the, you know, things like the MVP controller and the service nodes and OpenStack being deployed in infrastructure cabs. Again, these are more kind of you know, to give you an idea of how most people would deploy it, these aren't, you know, really strict requirements. Okay. This is too complicated. I'm not going to say it. So. All right. The last thing I want to talk about, or second to last thing, is service nodes. Um, so service nodes, we saw them before being used to reach that remote L2 gateway. Um, primary use case is, is for broadcast and multicast replication. So we can have the source um, hypervisor replicate a broadcast and multicast, right, that has to be sent from one hypervisor to every other VM that, um, you know, every other hypervisor that has a VM on that same network. But there's also these set of service nodes that you can use to kind of offload that work from the hypervisor so it's not consuming CPU on the hypervisor. Um, you know, you can, you can pick which model makes sense for you. It has a lot of that same kind of HA um, fast detection of failure using data claim probing stuff of the L3 gateway. So there's, there's in fact, it's a, kind of a simpler case in the L3 gateway. So 
uh, because you actually can just replicate the state to all of the service nodes as opposed to having to have actives and backups. So, but again, this is just the, the general theme, right, is that anything in the data plane or the control plane needs to have scale out and really good AHA properties. So the last thing that you can't forget, right, is the management and operator tools. So a couple cool, cool things to point out here is, um, you know, like I said, we do tunnel monitoring. So you, so you as a um, operator can tell whether, you know, your physical network is giving you any connectivity problems. There's even something really cool called the port to port troubleshooting tool, which is if, if, if two VMs, you know, if a tenant calls and says, I've got these two VMs and they can't talk, you can actually just enter them in to a page and say, show me the connectivity between these guys. And they will show you what hypervisor they're on, you know, what IP addresses the tunnels are using, uh, what type of encapsulation they're using, whether the tunnel monitoring is up, all of that. And you can even use a tool called Traceflow, which is shown here, to actually actively inject traffic in that path between those two VMs and kind of confirm that your physical network is or is not forwarding that traffic. So I, I like both of these things because they're really great examples of things that you're like, wow, I can't even, never even would have thought about being able to do something like that until you kind of have this network virtualization framework built up and you have the infrastructure. Another really cool thing that I mentioned is around upgrade, right? Because we have, this is built as a distributed system, we can fully automate the new deployment of, of, of new versions. We can verify compatibility, all of that. We can roll back. And as I mentioned earlier, you can do online upgrade, right? So that you don't have to really take your whole system down from a provisioning perspective uh, to, to be able to upgrade the software, which is another cool kind of tie-in to the fact that we're able to release you know, four times a year. So it means not only do we release software frequently, but you're actually able to consume it frequently. So the last thing I wanted to make before wrapping up was just I get a lot of, probably the biggest misconception about MVP out there is that it's just about scale. And I think that's because a lot of, a lot of people are aware of our larger scale deployments. They're, they kind of, I hear them saying, you know, oh, well, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do that once I get big, but I'm not sure there's any benefit in the short term. Um, I just want to call out a couple very important things. So first off, data plane performance. We talked about the tunneling mechanisms. I actually cut out a slide on something called STT, but this is a really hyper-optimized tunneling uh, mechanism that we have that's able to take advantage of uh, TCP segmentation offload. So it gives you really, really good forwarding performance compared to something like GRE. Um, you know, you probably, this is, this is a theme you probably got, but right, fast, reliable, high availability, both in the data plane and the control plane, right? Your network is something that always needs to work. It's a core piece of your infrastructure. You know, the rich logical network capabilities, it's not just about creating VLANs that can stretch across um, two physical uh, layer two segments. It's about being able to do security, statistics, quality of service. It's about being able to onboard customers or bring in physical workloads um, into logical networks. And like I just showed, it's a lot about operator tools and being able to actually operationalize this and be able to do things like upgrade and troubleshooting in a very you know, efficient and effective way. So with that, um, I'm happy to take some questions and also just encourage you to uh, check out some of our other sessions that we have. Um, then in particular, Martin Casado, I kind of focus more on the technical side here. Um, on Wednesday, he's, our, he's the CTO and founder of NYSERA. He'll actually be talking about uh, more of the kind of the customer side of things. You know, what is he seeing out there? This guy travels, you know, all around the world. I don't think he's been home in, in, in a month, literally. And so he, uh, you know, he's going to be talking more from the customer side. So it's a really good kind of uh, complement to this session, which is more focused on the, on the technical side. So that's it. Thanks.